Good morning, everybody. We're going to talk about the evolution of the European tech ecosystem. Uh, with us today is Julius Köhler, co-founder of Sender, Europe's largest digital freight forward. Julius, can you say a few things about yourself? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so my name is Julius. I come from Stuttgart uh, in southern Germany originally. Um, that's where I grew up, spent my youth or my teenage years uh, in the US uh, before then actually coming to Berlin um, almost 10 years ago. Um, that's where I founded uh, along with uh, two friends uh, and now actually also a family member. <laughs> Uh, the, the company Sender, um, a digital road freight forwarder, uh, today the largest digital road freight forwarder in all of Europe, um, where basically we serve um, two, two customers to a type of marketplace um, with uh, large-scale shippers, the likes of Coca-Cola, Unilever, etc. on the one side, um, as well as small-scale carrier companies, mostly family-owned trucking companies um, on the other side, and through the marketplace basically match up um, the, the two sides. So that, um, in a nutshell, um, is a quick introduction uh, to me and quickly, quickly to Sender. But how about you? So um, I've been with Excel for the last 20 years now, and um, as such, have um, gained like a, a really interesting perspective on the European startup ecosystem. So Excel itself is a multi-stage global venture capital firm. We got started 43 years ago in, uh, in Palo Alto, California, and then decided to open up an office in London back in 2000, so almost 25 years ago. So next year, we're gearing up for our 25th anniversary here in Europe. Then, because we were convinced that venture capital is essentially a global business. And then later on in 2008, we opened up an office in India to, uh, to address the Indian market. So um, maybe what I tell a bit about what Europe was like back in 2000. So we raised our first European fund. We're now on fund number eight, but our first European fund we raised in 2000. And, and the big questions RLPs would ask us is, is Europe able to generate billion dollar outcomes? Because in those days, the, 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 the typical motion was that people would start a company and very early on in the development of that company, they would sell the business. So a typical outcome would be a two or $300 million acquisition, typically by, by a US company. And on two or $300 million outcomes, you cannot generate a successful venture capital funds because successful venture capital funds are all um, dependent on outliers. On, on companies that can become billion dollar companies and if we own a, a decent number of that, that can kind of return a fund and then, and then the economics start to work. So, but that hadn't happened before. So LPs would say, can this happen? Can billion dollar outcomes happen in Europe? We of course said yes, but we had to wait five years for the first unicorn to show up. That was in 2005, that was Skype. And then we had to wait another five years for the next two to show up. So arguably, in the first 10 years, it, it was pretty slow going. Now, of course, it's very different because we, we did this report called the Founder Factory Report, and we studied to what extent unicorns generate new businesses. And what we found is that of the roughly 250 unicorns that Europe has, 1,500 new businesses were generated, so it's almost or is that do the math, like a factor of six, where um, big companies generate new startups. And that's a motion in the ecosystem that will get the whole ecosystem going. Super interesting. I mean, as you, as you said, uh, you joined Excel in 2004, so you've been around the block a couple more times than, uh, than, than I have. Um, but 
sort of how how has that um, kind of evolved to today, um, jumping from the present uh, from the from the past more into into the present um, in in terms of in terms of dynamics. Yeah, well, so in the very beginning, we were very focused on just the UK and Israel. So though those were the key startup markets, and then little by little. We uh, made our first investment in France. We made our first investment in uh, in Germany, and, and many of these markets were very undeveloped. So, for example, the whole concept of preferred shares in Germany doesn't really exist. So we kind of had to invent it contractually because it's a detail in the U.S. A preferred share is a is an entity. It, it exists in corporate law. In, in Germany it doesn't, so you had to make it up contractually. So a lot of those things had to be developed, both in Germany and in France. So it was, it was very slow going, and it was a lot of reinvention uh, of the wheel that had to happen to make things happen yeah. here. Now, today, we uh, invest in over 60 cities, because the ecosystems are typically city-oriented. Uh, we've learned that outliers can come from anywhere, we had a company called UiPath that came out of Roma, uh, Roma, Bucharest, Romania. So of course, we were the Series A backer of uh, Supercell, which came off Helsinki. So what we learned is you cannot just cover a few cities in Europe. You really have to cover the whole geography, which is a lot of work and a lot of travel. Yeah. For me, I mean, I, I came to Berlin in 2016. Um, Berlin was sort of like the startup hub, the startup um, hub of, uh, of Germany. Um, I had originally met my two co-founders um, back in 2010 during an internship, um, and then sort of step by step kicked off, um, kicked off the fundraising and the, the company building uh, process. And the beginning was slightly difficult. Um, David, one of my two co-founders, uh, founded the business originally. Um, uh, failed with the first business model, and then Nico, my second co-founder, and I came on board, um, sort of uh, all together, then rebuilt the, the business model, um, and then step by step went into into the fundraising journey. And at the time, for for us, which was then um, early 2017, a lot of companies sort of arose having a similar kind of business model uh, to to that of ours, um, and it made it super, super competitive in, in regards to a fundraising environment. And we spoke to a couple, a couple of early stage players. Um, Mostly based in Germany? Uh, yeah, it was actually, it was, it was all across Europe, I, mm -hmm. I'd say, at the, at the time. Um, and in the end, we actually closed our seed round um, with Scania, Scania Growth Capital, okay. uh, based out of Sweden. Um, some of you might know is the, the leading truck manufacturer yep. um, in, in Europe. They really sort of liked our approach, liked our business model. Um, but I think for rather traditional VCs, the likes of Excel, et cetera, um, it was very difficult at the time to sort of identify the kind of winning, winning horse. Yeah. Um, what was the pushback that you got in those days? And how hard was it? How many, how many VC firms did you, did you see? And honestly, I think we spoke, we spoke to pretty much everybody, like the, okay. the lo from the large scale ones um, at, uh, at the time. Um, and there wasn't a clear differentiation um, in, in regards to our business model. And then also needs to be said that our market until today is, is very, very traditional. Um, it's a handshake kind of industry. Um, a, a lot of the bookings uh, for, for booking a truck uh, still happen via email or, or over the phone. Um, and uh, it wasn't clear how the tech play was going to, was going to look. Uh, can you build a strong tech company out of that, or is it more going to be a tech-enabled mm. um, um, company? And everybody sort of kind of moved to the sideline um, and, and kind of wanted to see how things would, uh, would evolve. Um, so we managed to convince um, um, Scania, as the truck manufacturer at the time, who um, had just recently set up um, Scania Growth Capital, which is basically the VC arm, um, of the of the trucking company, um, and that actually then gave us the first capital to kind of build the the the, the basics of the of the business, um, and then in 2018 um, managed to sort of set ourselves apart 
um, and uh, yeah, then step by step went into into the further further fundraising uh, process until yeah, Excel. So us. your Series A was uh, with HV HV okay. Capital uh, as well as Project A, um, and then you joined and us. Then we did the Series exactly B. Right. in the in right. the Series B. Um, but uh, yeah, it was extremely competitive uh, in the start. Um, later on, we ended up acquiring most of the companies um, that started. Because how many direct competitors did you have at the time? There was a handful. Um, the Instafreight, uh, also based out of Berlin. There was Everroad, um, based out of uh, out of Paris, which we acquired, um, which we acquired later. Um, there was Inroute, uh, based out of Madrid um, or, or Barcelona at the time, which we also acquired. Um, so yeah, there there were a couple a uh, couple players that had a similar approach. Where uh, it must also be said that. Uh, logistics market is gigantic. I mean, if you take a look around, like everything that you see here came here on a truck, and it wasn't only on a truck once, um, but if you take the wood of the table, it came on the truck out of the woods, it went into the sawing mill, then it went from the sawing mill to a factory, and then from the factory to, I don't know, Ikea. Um, but um, uh, yeah, things end up uh, three to five times on a truck on, on average, so it's a 400 billion euro uh, market in, in total in the segment that we serve is the full truckload uh, segment and that's something that we focused on right from the start. It hasn't changed until today is that uh, we basically have one customer, one shipper, so one Coca-Cola and we transport one load of Coca-Cola for them. Okay, okay. Um, and tell me, so capital is one ingredient into building a company but, but people isn't even more important ingredient into building a company. To tell us a bit like how, how you built the company up to a thousand employees now through a number of acquisitions and how difficult or easy was it to find the right people for the right job? So maybe starting with my, with my two founders I shared that I met them in, in, in 2010. Um, during an internship, the three of us were lined up in an internship kickoff, a friendship developed out of it. Um, uh, today, uh, David, my co-founder, is actually married to my sister, so it's also a kind of family business um, that we've got going on at the, at the same time. Um, but the two of them have sort of been, been the, the underlying uh, fundament that I think made it, or that, that allowed the company to be so successful, um, as um, they're just the two people that I trust the most and vice versa, I'd say. Um, so like, uh, whenever, whenever we ran into issues or problems, we're the first ones to sort of consult um, one, one another. Um, now, when it comes to, to sort of talent uh, specifically, I think there's certain cycles that you, that you go through when building a business, basically the first stage of founding a business, um, then kind of uh, running a business and then managing a business, um, where I think we're in sort of the, the third tier um, at the moment um, and really have sort of the resources and the capital to bring large scale talent on board. For instance, we most recently hired the chief product officer uh, from Booking.com um, who, um, who was at Booking for nearly 10 years. Um, so we have a super strong um, management of the of the company today um, that sort of uh, yeah leads the transformational processes, especially when it comes to the kind of M and A um, that uh, that we've been doing um, uh, yeah over the last years and most recently actually acquired um, the European part of an American company of C H Robinson, um, which will add roughly uh, another 700 people. Um, on, on top, so that's probably going to be the biggest challenge from a cultural pers perspective um, that uh, we'll have to go through um, to basically yeah, put all of that under, under one roof um, and uh, yeah, ensure sort of a, a smooth process. W of what that. has your approach been to keep a consistent culture? Because you, you've made six, seven acqu acquisitions yeah. thus far, yeah. and all these all these companies come with their own culture. So, so, so how has it been uh, become a cohesive one? Yeah. Um, so there, there are a couple of things um, that we that we do, which 
I would say have become a bit of a norm or like an, a, a standard um, um, today that we have a type of uh, body program, we have an academy, so whenever somebody joins newly, um, we run them through a two-week kind of, kind of training to understand the company culture, um, to understand the processes, um, um, etc. Um, and then I think sort of the, the pinnacle of, of defining company culture um, happens every year when we have the Sender Summer Camp, uh, which is an event in Italy uh, where um, everybody comes in and we spend, depending on, on uh, where you sit in the, in the company, uh, between four days and an entire week, uh, where we then do sort of strategy, strategy planning, team building exercises, um, and have a bit of fun um, on, the, on the side as well. But that's sort of like a couple of things that we do or, or use um, to f yeah, foster company, company culture and, and kind of build that. Is there, like, I mean, for you, you're uh, super involved with Celones, um, with Czech24, with Pezzonio, um, etc. cetera. Um, sort of looking at, at their perspective and also going through, through M&A, um, is there anything, I don't know, that you, that you saw? Uh, worth well, what, one, of our, one of the things that we are frequently involved with is is enterprise software companies that get started in, in Europe and that want to become global businesses. And if you want to become a global leader, you've got to be number one in the US. And if you want to be number one in the US, you, you really got to have a significant presence there. So, analogous to your challenge of having a consistent culture in order to have a consistent culture, in that way, you've got to have one of the founders or the founder go to the US, typically to establish commercial headquarters. So the typical model is you keep R&D here, product and R&D here in, in Europe, but the commercial headquarters would be in the US. And that typically involves a founder going to the US, hiring the first VP of marketing, VP of sales, building an office there, and again, trying to keep a consistent culture so that the US part of the business and the European yeah. part of the business really is one. Yeah, I mean, what proved to be super helpful through this entire journey for, for me was having, having a mentor. Um, and as part, of our, as part of our Series A, um, the, the Flixbus founders invested into, into Sender. Okay. Um, and, and Daniel, one of, the, one of the three founders, has sort of become, become my mentor. Um, I'd say that Flixbus always sort of like, uh, I don't know, two steps ahead of, of us in regards to company development. Um, and whenever, whenever I sort of have questions, whether it's, I don't know, um, regarding company, company structure, culture, um, topics with my co-founders, etc., cetera, um, he's sort of like the, the go-to person um, uh, for, for me. Um, and that's also something that I think we then try to give back into the, the type of startup community and it'll also be interesting to sort of hear your perspective in a second um, as, as angel investors and as mentors um, uh, yeah, to, to really sort of help founders um, in, in building the company and, and shaping the company. Is that I know, something that existed 20 years ago? That, that to, type to, of to some extent, but, but, but not to the, to the extent that it happens today. But in that context, you guys started a fund called Boom, right? Tell us a bit more about that. Yeah, um, so um, my, my two co-founders, um, as well as Felix, um, uh, we, we started a Boom, uh, or we started Boom. Um, it's, it's a fund to, to really yeah, support early stage, uh, early stage companies, early stage founders. Um, um, it is being operated as a solo GP by Felix and then David, Nico and myself. Um, we uh, really act as, as mentors and, and sparing partners um, to uh, founders um, and yeah, really assist them uh, with whatever topics they, they might have, uh, whether it's, I don't know, a salary negotiation uh, with the board uh, to setting up a VOP structure um, that um, uh, yeah, helps them sort of recruit uh, talent. Um, so yeah, that in a nutshell um, is sort of, sort of boom and uh, the, the, the yeah, engagement that we 
have with um, the, the startup ecosystem right. as mentors. If, if you look back on the um, almost 10 years now at Sender, what, what are a few lessons that you've learned that, that, that you wish you had known before? <laughs> yeah, I mean, um, we've, we've, come a long, we've come a long way. Um, and I think that the basics that you, that you always hear, sort of uh, the higher slow and fire, fire fast, et cetera, they, these aren't myths. Um, like they, they do apply. And I think um, especially when it comes to that, um, we have um, we may have made wrong decisions, um, sort of keeping talent uh, on board um, for for too long. Um, but on the other side, when it comes to our business model, um, what I would say really really helped us is sort of the, the continuity. Is that our business model hasn't changed since day one? Um, we said we would focus on, on full truck loads. We would do that in Europe only, so we don't operate on any, any other continents. Um, we would have sort of a, um, a minimum distance of 300 kilometers. Um, and I think these kind of um, pillars that, that we built the, the company on um, have been super vital um, to, to the success. Um, and I think sort of helped us in, 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 grow the, in growing the, the company and also setting us apart from, from our competitors. Um, so I think that is sort of the, uh, probably the, the biggest learning that um, after um, pivoting once, which happened in the, in the, in the early days, um, to yeah, really sort of define a business model and then sort of pulling, pulling through um, with, with yeah. that. If I look back on the 25 years, what, what, what we have learned in, in the venture business, I think can be boiled down to kind of three points. So one is, it's all about the entrepreneur. Um, two is, it's all about the outliers. So it's all about the really big companies that can determine a really big outcome for, for a venture fund. And what's required for really big outcomes is, is really big businesses. So for people to, if you've got something good going, to just try and keep growing the business and, and, and build it into a really large and valuable company and to just keep going yeah. is, is one of the key things. And then the last thing that we, that we kind of learned was great companies can come from anywhere whether it's, uh, it's Berlin for Sender, whether, whether it's like UiPath uh, in, in Bucharest, like a supercell in, in Helsinki or, or a Salonis in Munich, these aren't the, 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 the obvious places to, uh, to come from. So we, we've got to cover a big, a big geo. So if we now look at the future of, of the European tech ecosystem, what, what, what would you wish for? What, what do you think is important in, uh, in making sure that this ecosystem keeps growing and, and, and becomes, it's now one third of the US uh, ecosystem, but it keeps growing. Yeah. So I think that uh, the, the ecosystem has evolved super, super strongly over the last uh, couple, couple of years. And I see it in Germany, for example, now, uh, Berlin was sort of the, the startup hub of, of Germany. Uh, and now Munich is sort of uh, becoming the, the second uh, kind of um, kind of base, um, and uh, there are no borders anymore. Just like just like you said, uh, with your iPad coming from coming from Bucharest. Um, so I think that's something that uh, we just need to need to continue to sort of follow um, over um, over the next uh, next couple of years. Um, what I see now, and that's something that um, uh, that I very much like, and um, I think that's something that we have, uh, require even more. Um, in the in the future, um, is yeah for for investors to, to come even closer to, to sort of the founders and open continue opening opening doors also towards other founders. Uh, for me specifically as a founder, this has sort of been uh, one of the most changing changing events in this entire journey of having having a mentor a partner um, on the on the side, and I think that's something um, that uh, yeah we continue to to sort of require. Um, uh, yeah, and that we, that we sort of need yeah. to. Yeah, from my perspective, it's similarly in the sense that what, what I think is really important for the ecosystem now is to also get liquidity back to, uh, um, back to our investors. 
but that also means that founders will have liquidity and founders will have liquidity to seed invest in, in, in new companies and then become mentors to the next generation of entrepreneurs. Uh, Julius, it, it was wonderful to, uh, to chat. I hope this was helpful, with a helpful perspective on uh, what has happened in Europe and what we hope will happen in Europe when it comes to the tech ecosystem. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.